oceans in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to
Good morning. Uh, it's a little different today, and I want to just tell you why. We have one of our missionaries that is sharing uh, in service today, and because of where they work and who they work with, and because of security reasons, uh, we can't live stream them, even share their name, which is the reason why I encourage as many people who could come into the building. But if not, we wanted to give you, if you weren't able to come in to the service today, I want to give you an opportunity to just kind of gather around the Word together over the next several minutes. We're going to be looking at Psalm 17, so I'd invite you to turn there. Uh, we'll continue on with our series in Matthew next week with regular live stream services. So thanks for kind of uh, being flexible with us this week and just encourage you to pray for our missionary. Uh, JG is what we're calling him online. If you just encourage you to pray for him and then uh, maybe that's kind of how we'll think about this psalm here today in praying uh, through everything. And so kind of as we begin, as you're turning to Psalm 17, uh, maybe just ask a question, and that is, is it okay to argue? Uh, you know, when I was getting ready to deploy as a 19-year-old uh, young man, uh, my mother and my grandparents uh, took me to Fort Rucker, Alabama uh, before uh, I was to deploy. They took me up there and I remember sitting, uh, I was at an old Charlie's with my family and while we were there, um, my grandmother and I uh, were having an Irish conversation or an argument and uh, for us, my grandmother came over on a boat from Ireland so she was as Irish as you could be. If you just imagine Mrs. Doubtfire, that was my grandmother. And so we're having a conversation going back and forth and my mom is like, this is, you guys stress me out. You just argue and my grandmother and I, we stop, we look at each other, we're like, this is, this is just a conversation. This is what we do. This is our love language. And so we kind of just joke that, uh, you know, our love language language that we have, uh, you know, they say there's five love languages for the Irish, there's six, and that sixth one is argumentation. There, and arguing is not this thing that talks about yelling and getting mad and incensed, but rather arguing is this, you know, passionate plea of, uh, you know, giving evidence and saying, hey, this is what I feel and believe and, and being passionate in a conversation with reverence. Um, and respect throughout. I always loved and my grandmother's most godly woman outside of my wife that I've ever known. And uh, so all of our conversations that we had, even arguments, were, were nothing of you know anger involved, but ra rather a passionate plea. And uh, Charles Spurgeon, the old Baptist pastor, said that it is good that we argue with God in prayer. Is when we argue with God in prayer, it helps us to clarify what we are saying, what we are praying, and what we are believing. And he encouraged us to do that so that we would be sure that when we are praying, that we are praying the will of God. Uh, we have not because we ask not. We ask with wrong motives, we, and we do not ask according to God's will. So Spurgeon would encourage us to look at Psalm 17 and to pray in such a way um, that we would be praying in accordance with God's will as we look at this. So we'll we'll talk about five ways that we see prayer kind of framed within this. Um, as we kind of look through the book of Psalms, there's, 100 and, uh, there's 150 Psalms, and here the 17th Psalm is the first Psalm that is listed as a prayer. Most Psalms would be, um, some of them are prayers, some of them are songs, um, some of them are prayers of lament and statements, but this is the first one that is given as a prayer. Many of them are prayers. This is the first one out of all 150 that is listed as that. And it's and it's framed in a chiasm. So chi is the Greek word, is a Greek letter for X. And you can just, um, it's the way that it's framed. So the beginning and the ending of the psalm are the same material in kind of this format like A, B, C, B, A, kind of forming almost like an X. And so the center of this psalm is actually the center and the main point um, of the whole of this whole psalm. Many of the psalms are written like this. Much Hebrew literature is actually written in this chiastic formula. So we'll see that. And really the, the chiasm comes to the center at verse 7, talking about the great love of God that we'll get there uh, soon. So here, just looking at this as a prayer, um, we'll kind of break. I'll kind of break this down for you. The first five verses, David the psalmist is writing and he's praying, and he is bringing before he goes to the Lord, asking for something. He brings this 
appeal based upon his character and on who he is. Verses one through five, I invite with you, I invite you to read those with me. It says, Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From your presence, let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold the right. And, and right here is this idea of being right with God. Have you, you have tried my heart and you have visited me by night. You have tested me and you will find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. With regard to the works of man and by, your, by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your past and my feet have not slipped. So David's first initial appeal here is one of self-examination that says, God, look at me and hear me. It's a bit brash and even brazen, right? David begins his prayer by saying, hear a just cause, O Lord. He's saying, Lord, there in all capital letters is the word for Yahweh, the, the divine name. And so he's calling God by name. He's saying, attend to my cry, hear my prayers. Give ears to my lips that are free from deceit. So he's saying what I've said with my mouth God, hear me. Why? Because what I've said with my mouth is not deceitful, but it is true. He's saying, from your presence, let me be vindicated. Why? Uh, And let your eyes behold what is right, that I am right with you. And because I am right with you, uh, Lord, let me uh, be heard. Let my vindication come. He says, you've tried my heart. So the Lord has tested David's heart and you've come to me by night. So David has been faithful during the day. He's been faithful during the night. Uh, There you've tested me and you'll find nothing. He says, I have purpose that my mouth will not transgress. And so David says here, the words that he is speaking, they have not crossed over. That idea of transgression is to cross over a clearly given word, a clearly given law of God. And that's where he says, with regard to the works of man and by the word of your lips. So God, by your word, both by man's standard and by your word, I have not transgressed with my life and my steps have held fast to your paths and my feet have not slipped. So where I have gone, what I have said, what the intentions and desire of my heart are, I have not transgressed, I've not broken your law. Now David is probably writing this. He's talking about God's presence. He's probably writing this when he is hiding from Saul, his father-in-law, the cave of Amandulam. He's, he's hiding from him. Saul's probably thrown a spear or two at him at this point. And he's, he's running from him. But he's saying, God, hear my prayer. Uh, let me be vindicated. You have tried me. You have tested me. Uh, protect me. He says, because I have not wronged. Now, at this point, David has not, uh, he has not had Uriah killed. He has not been with Bathsheba. None of that has happened. But still, David is not sinless. And so we have to see maybe a dual fulfillment of this idea of this personal appeal, this self-examination that we have. So first, as David is saying, with your word and with the law of God, I have not committed an offense. But remember, in the Old Testament, when you would sin, there was a means to cover that sin or to uh, have it uh, taken care of. And that was through the Old Testament sacrificial system. Now we have this, like I said, we have this dual role of fulfillment because here David is functioning as a type of, of, a, of a model for us, as a Christological figure. And we know that God made a covenant or an agreement, a pact, an agreement with David that Jesus was to fulfill, that Jesus is the son of man, the son of David. He's in that line. And so the promise that God made to David that one would come from his family who would forever sit on the throne is fulfilled in Jesus. So as David is writing this, it's looking forward to the time when Christ would come. And so when we come to the Lord in prayer, we no longer have the Old Testament sacrifices We no longer have the scapegoat. We no longer have the guilt offering or the grain offering. We we no longer have any of these that we can do to cover for our sin because we have a real sacrifice who has covered and paid for our sin and his name is Jesus. So because Jesus died on the cross for us, we now, what has happened is God has taken away our sin. He's cast it as far as the east is from the west and he's given us the righteousness of Christ that Christ became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So we can be like David and go to the Lord in prayer saying, God, hear my prayer, hear my plea, hear this just cause. 
not because I have righteousness of myself. Let your eyes, verse 2, let your eyes behold the right. I don't want you to see the right God that is in me, but rather when you look at me because I'm a believer in Jesus and because he died in my place. Now because of that, hear my cry, hear my plea, because the righteousness that I have is the very real righteousness of Jesus. So what does that mean for us as believers? Does that mean we sin that grace might abound? No, because scripture is clear in 1 John that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That we must, he who says he has no sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. So even though we have the righteousness of Christ and even though we are believers in Jesus, we still must confess our sin and we still need to take this in this secondary role. So primarily when we look at this, we take this first and say, are we a believer in Jesus? Do we have the righteousness of Christ? And then in a secondary way, let's take this and let's do some self-examination and say, can I say these things? Or is there sin in my life that is keeping my relationship with God at a distance? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or His ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities or your sin has made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that he does not hear. So Isaiah the prophet is writing and saying that because of your sins, God is not hearing your prayer. So James Montgomery Boyce, old pastor of 10th Presbyterian in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, gives us five questions of self-examination that we should do when we come to the Lord in prayer. And they are this, number one, are we being disobedient? Is there a part of God's word that we are we know we are willfully being disobedient in our life? So we should confess that and repent of that. Number two, are we being selfish? Is there something in your life, if you were to just pause and close your eyes for just a moment, say, Lord, am I being, is there something in my life where I'm being selfish or disobedient? If the Lord brings these things to your mind, then you should confess them, which means to agree and repent of those sins. Number three is, are we neglecting some important duty? Is there something that we should be doing that we are not doing that we need to repent and confess to the Lord? Number four, is there wrong that we should first make right? You bow down your head. If you bow your head and you go to the Lord in prayer and the Lord brings something to your mind, there's someone that you have wronged, something wrong that you have done, The Spirit of God works in us to convict us of that sin so that that separation would not be there and that the Lord would not have His ears dull to our prayers. And number five, are our priorities in order? The battle for most Christians is is not one of these greater things, but rather what we have to do is not seek the good in place of the best. And many times we we have to fight that our priorities would be in order. You know, many times people will take their priorities and and they they mix them up. And they, they don't do bad, they don't have bad priorities, but what they have is they have their priorities out of order. So at times there there may be men that are seeking a better job or more money, maybe greater material goods. Maybe you're in a midlife crisis and you just really want something. Uh, and maybe this something isn't bad. I'd love a boat. A boat is not a bad thing, but if I seek a boat greater than I do, uh, worshiping the Lord, walking with Him, caring and loving my wife and being a dad, um, then my priorities are out of whack. And it's not uh, priorities in this sense. These are not things that are bad, but rather good and not in the best order. We're seeking the Lord first in all that we do. One commentator said that, Uh, we must find ourselves to be in the presence of the Lord and to have our conscience to be clean and clear with Him. It says this, If any man trusting to the testimony of a good conscience, which he enjoys, neglects the exercise of prayer, he defrauds God of the honor which belongs to Him by not referring His cause to Him. 
and in not leaving him to judge and determine it. So let us learn also that when we present ourselves before God in prayer, it is not to be done with the ornaments of great eloquence and wonderful words or the finest rhetoric, but by the best grace that we can have before him, which is just being pure, being simply being pure in him. And so it is us for us that if we are examining ourselves before the Lord and there's no sin that the God has brought to us, then he calls us to approach his throne boldly and to seek him humbly and don't defraud God the honor of answering our prayer. We'll run through the next ones quickly. Verses 6 through 9. First, he's done this personal appeal of self-examination and then he gives an appeal David gives an appeal based on his relationship with the Lord. It says this, I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye and hide me in the shadow of your wings from the, violent, from the wicked who do me violence and my deadly enemies who surround me. Me. So he's now banking things on not his, uh, his own life, but based upon the relationship that he has with God. He says, I'm calling upon you that you will answer me. Incline your ear. Why? He says, wondrously show or demonstrate your steadfast love. And this is that center of that chiasm, the, the point in the meaning of this whole psalm. And this steadfast, you know what steadfast means? This is like a double dose of stubborn, right? You know somebody in your life that is steadfast. And this is kind of what you say. If someone, if your spouse is stubborn, you don't say, you're so stubborn. You just say, you are steadfast in your convictions. What you hear says God is steadfast in his love. This word love is this word in Hebrew chesed, which is this covenantal love that God initiates this love relationship with his people. That God is the one that moved first in this relationship. You didn't go seeking after God. You were running from God, dead in your sins, and God in being rich in mercy because of his chesed, his covenantal love, calls you to be his son, to be his daughter. And so he is saying, wondrously show your steadfast love to those who seek refuge. And then he says, keep me as the apple of your eye. The apple of your eye would be your pupil. So the dead, the dead center. All right. So another way that you could say that is keep me in your view. Keep, keep your eyes with me. And a lot of these verses, it's interesting so, right, David has the covenant that is made with him that Jesus fulfills later. And then you remember before David, there was Moses who, who the Lord made a covenant with him and the law. And here, a lot of these verses are actually mimicked in Deuteronomy 32 and also Exodus 15. The song of Moses after the nation of Israel has been delivered from Egypt. Exodus 15 says this, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? And who is like you, majestic in holiness? awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand and the earth swallowed them. You have, and here it is, you have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed and you have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. And so maybe just a question to ask yourself is, how does God's steadfast covenantal love affect your prayer life. See, if you're a believer in Jesus and the Lord has brought no sin present to your mind that you can confess or repent from, then, then take this idea and go to the Lord in prayer, not because you are worthy, but because we show God's worthiness by bringing our prayers to Him. Another way for us to understand the idea of this word honor would be worthiness. Right, so let's not defraud God of His worth. Let's not defraud God of His honor by keeping back our prayers from Him. So we go to the Lord with self-examination. We go to the Lord with, uh, on the basis of our relationship with Him. And then um, in prayer, we can bring our opposition and really the reason for our prayer. That's what David does in verses 10 through 12. Look at what it says. 
I'm talking about those who are that are have, he's having issues with. He says they close their hearts to pity. With their mouth they speak arrogantly. They have now surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion eager to tear, as a young lion lurking in ambush. The the first verse there in verse 10 it says they close their hearts to pity is kind of it literally means they they are enclosed in their own fat. Now I resemble that remark. And the idea here is that if you can imagine uh, maybe two brothers grow up and one is larger and the other is, is quite skinny, uh, you can imagine that the one that is larger uh, is the one that's getting all the food. He's getting the fatty foods, the flavorful foods. He's getting the abundance of things. And there's this, this skinny, scrawny one that is laying around. And, and so this is like a Hebrew idiom that says you've got no mercy, right? You're the one that's gobbling up all the fat stuff. You have abundance while there are people here who are starving and so relationally and interpersonally there are people who are pursuing David, Saul, and maybe the army here who is taking the good and the spoils of things and there is David who is the Lord's anointed who is being oppressed and pursued and it may not be that there are people in your life who are pursuing you and you're living out in the woods somewhere, but maybe there are people in your life that you are viewing as some type of opposition from you following and making life difficult. And they're people who just have no mercy. It may be your boss, it might be your neighbor, it might be somebody in your family and you're thinking about seeing them on Thanksgiving. And you're thinking, these are people who are selfish, self-motivated, without mercy and harsh. We can bring these types of people to the Lord in prayer and, and for us to all recognize that all people who are not believers in Jesus, their greatest need is not that they would be merciful or not that they would be loving or generous, but that they would know Christ and that that would be the motivation for their mercy. That should be our motivation for mercy to others. So we bring these oppositions to the Lord in prayer. It says that they are ones who speak arrogantly and and this is this they they wanting David not just opposed but cast down and defeated so don't think for a moment that if we just live this life everything will be good and easy we are right now pre-recording this message because we don't want and we cannot have our missionary face and name and country that he's working in plainly known because there are people who would not just oppose him but want him cast down, kicked out, and removed at best. So let's not think like this world is gumdrops and lollipops. There's an enemy out there who hates you, wants your life destroyed. He wants you to have your priorities messed up. He wants you to pursue your own motivations. He does not want you to pursue Christ. And so he'll try to give you distractions. But here, this is why we examine ourselves. We live our life not based upon our good works, but after examining ourselves, we live our life based upon our relationship with God, which is only there because of Christ. And then number three, we recognize our opposition. And then we can bring our request to the Lord. Let's look at what David's request is in verses 13 and the first part of 14. It says, Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword and from men by your hand, O Lord. And then he says, From men whom the who uh, met from men of the world whose portion is in this life. David is asking for God to deliver him, for him to arise and confront him, subdue him by the sword. Or this is, David is not saying, Lord, would you just speak nicely to him? This word arise, I always think if you've seen maybe movies where there's, you know, a, a, a monster that's coming up out of the sea. Not that God is a monster, but it's one of those. I had a, a friend who's larger than most, taller than most, and he was sitting and kind of slouching one day. And somebody said something to him that was maybe a bit aggressive. And then he just stood up and, you know, when he stood up, he just continued to stand and he just kept getting tall. And a person was looking up like, oh my goodness. Like, oh yeah. Like this is the idea of God arise, like come and just envelop this person and show them your might and your strength. And here, as he does this, he's saying, subdue him, take him down by your sword and from 
these men, God. So this request, David is asking for the Lord to act in a specific way. Now, if you've been reading gentle and lowly with us, you know that for believers, um, the way that God acts to us is with loving kindness and with mercy. And one thing that I thought was so neat with our chapters just a week ago was that we think when we think of God, we think that God's kind of de facto, the, the way that He acts just normally is for judgment and for wrath. But the scripture says when it talks about God, it is of His steadfast love for His believers. And it's only in persistent, uh, unrepentant sin that God acts in judgment and wrath. That God's kind of, you know, modus operandi, His de facto way that He acts is with mercy and with kindness and with love towards those who believe. And that's the way that God's heart is for us. And so it is God's pleasure to deliver His people. Think that Jesus, for the joy that was set before Him, did not forsake the cross, but endured it, so that we might be redeemed. And so, who are we when we are in a tough time, opposed, depressed, struggling? Who are we to not bring these prayer requests to the Lord and asking Him to arise and to act? It's the good pleasure of God to act for His people. And then look at the reward, the last 14b and 15. And you can see how the first part of verses 1 and 2 kind of match verse 15, talking about this righteousness. It says, uh, Lord, you from the men of the world whose portion is in this life. He says their portion is in this life. And what is this? Is you fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children and they leave their abundance to the infants. And we see this contrast here, but these first people, we see the contrast with these people of the world who, who have the world's pleasures, who have the desires of the world, the riches of the world, the treasures of this world. And in fact, they can leave them to their kids and to their kids' kids. And sometimes I think that we get so frustrated and we have such a hard time when we see people of this world who are not walking with Jesus, who have all these material blessings. But these blessings, these material blessings that these people have, don't think that God has not sovereignly given them to them. The difficult part for us as Christians is that we would, we would actually believe what the Bible says, is that our citizenship is in heaven, and that heaven is our home, and that our best life is not here. The way that God works with these material blessings with people who do not believe is that these material blessings serves as almost as a dual sense of judgment for them. One, that they continue to see the blessings of this world and the treasures of this world, and they do not worship the God that gave them to them, but rather because they desire them in their heart, that these creations of our Creator serve as our own, they serve as their own God where they worship them and love them. This idea of worship, say this, this loving them. They have these treasures within them that they have. But then the, the second form of this is that they don't respond to God rightly in worship. And then secondarily, a second form of judgment would be that they would say that they would be satisfied in this world by things of this world. This double sense of judgment that comes when the people of this world have all of the things of this world and they think, hey, I'm happy, I'm satisfied. See, God didn't create us to be satisfied with trinkets and toys and treasures of this world. God made us and made our hearts that only the eternal, only God Himself would bring us satisfaction and wholeness. And look at this great contrast to what David says. He says, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness, and when I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. And so maybe when we see this, we kind of come and say, hey, in prayer, are we just seeking the treasures of this world or are we seeking the face of God and His likeness that we would be satisfied with Him? Can you say that? 
Can we say that we are satisfied just with God? You know, our missionary that's sharing with us today does not have great material wealth and he is not ministering with people that have wealth at all. But when you meet a believer in Jesus who says, He is enough. He is satisfying. When we have that, we have all that we need. And then we can go, then we can pray and seek the Lord. Because God's desire is to act on your behalf. God's desire is to answer your prayer. If we want God to do that, then we must make sure that we are walking in faithful obedience, that we are a true believer in Jesus and our relationship with Him is right. When we kind of argue back and forth with God, we understand what the real opposition is. That we fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual powers and, and rulers and principalities. That our real issues are spiritual in nature, not physical. And when we ask God to move and work and act, and then we would be satisfied with God's own timing, with God's own answer for us. I invite you to pray with me, and I hope to see you uh, in our services next week. If not, we'll have regularly live stream services for you. But let's pray, and uh, we'll thank the Lord for this brief time together. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for our missionaries that are sharing with us today. Uh, Lord, we pray that, uh, Lord, you would burn in all of our hearts a passion that we would be satisfied with you alone, that we would be satisfied with your presence. Lord, that we would have a, a gospel fire burn within our hearts and within our church. And Lord, that you would use us and you would use our prayers. Lord, that we would see walls broken down, obstacles overcame for the glory of the name of Jesus. Help us to be people that seek your honor through the way that we pray. And it is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. See you guys next week.